Battle systems, boy do we love them, forming the foundations for how our authors craft thrilling clashes of good and evil. Battle systems are an incredibly important part of every manga or anime you enjoy. They exemplify the thematic messages of the author and provide a gateway into the uniqueness of their minds. Peer through the legendary manga and anime that have existed throughout the years. Think back to it. Sure, we absolutely love the characters. We loved the themes. We loved the messages. But you know what? We also loved the battle systems. I'm talking Dragon Ball's key system, Naruto's chakra system, Hunter Hunter's Nen system. I mean, oh my goodness, Togashi, you freaking genius. The One Piece Devil Fruit system, the modern day elite battle system from Jujutsu Kaisen, the cursed energy battle system, and there's so much more. Battle systems are so, so important for these stories. And in this video, in classic typological fashion, we're talking and focusing on Bleach's Reiatsu battle system. This is gonna be a good one. So buckle up and let's go. Building from the simple up to the complex, what lies at the very origin of Bleach's battle system is something called Reiyoku, or spiritual power. I personally like to call it spirit energy. Every spiritual being in human contains a certain amount of spiritual energy. When this energy is harnessed and trained, it sort of levels up into a more complex quality called Ryatsu or spiritual pressure. And this spiritual pressure is where all the fun really happens. Whether you're Quincy Hollow, Shinigami Human or Fullbringer, the foundation of whatever ability you use comes from this thing called spiritual pressure. So what I'm going to do here is cycle through the different major quote races of Bleach and break down their part in the battle system, along with any important ideals that make it function. So let's start big with the Shinigami. The Shinigami makes up the biggest part of Bleach cast, so a lot of time is spent elaborating on the ways Shinigami fight. In fact, when you think of Bleach's battle system, you essentially just straight up think of the Shinigami's style of fighting. Soul Reaper combat is divided into four styles, Zanjutsu, Hoho, Hakuda, and Kido. Zanjutsu refers to weapon art. It's the art of mastering whatever weapon you're given. In one sense, it's basic swordsmanship mastery, but also in this category is Zanpakuto mastery, like Shikai and Bankai. Hoho means movement art. For the Soul Reapers, movement art revolves around something called Shunpo or Flash Deck. Hakuda refers to martial arts, your ability to fight via hand-to-hand -hand combat. And finally, Kido is the magic art, measuring your proficiency in three subdivisions, binding spells or Bakudo, destruction spells, otherwise known as Hado, or healing spells, known as Kaidos. For a Soul Reaper to be deemed elite, he needs to be proficient in all four areas of Soul Reaper combat. We're going to break down all these fighting styles, don't you worry, and we're gonna start from Zanjutsu. Okay, so when a Soul Reaper enters the Shinyo Academy, they're given something called an Asauchi. It's a nameless sword that can become anything. The Shinigami is taught to spend time with this sword and imbue it with spiritual pressure. Eventually, depending on their level of talent and perhaps maybe the nature of their Zanpakuto, they'll be able to hear the voice of their Zanpakuto. If they're able to call out the name of their Zanpakuto, their sword transforms, taking on a unique visage. This first step is called Shikai. Every Shikai has a unique ability to it and a unique name. The Soul Reaper must interact with his sword, talk to it, converse with it, and grow closer to it. The key ideal that you must understand about Bleach's battle system, in contrast to other battle systems in anime, is that you can physically train to be better at sword play. You can train your body to move faster, to use stronger Kido, and so on. But Zanpakuto mastery is not tied to physical training. You're gonna have a hard time appreciating what Kubo is doing if you expect training arcs to be like other shows where they're physically pushing themselves, taking weeks, months to years on end to learn something. In Bleach, the key components between Zanpakuto and Soul Reaper is synergy and understanding. What this means is that the closer you are to your Zanpakuto, the stronger you will be as a Soul Reaper. It also indicates a direct correlation between age and Zanpakuto mastery. If getting closer to your Zanpakuto makes you stronger, 
then those who have lived longer and thus spent a longer time bonding with their blades will be stronger. So if you've ever wondered why the old dudes in Bleach are so OP as hell, like a Yamamoto or a Yachiru Unohana and the other hell-based captains or even Shinsui Kyoroku, it's because they've been alive long enough to pretty much learn everything they need to know about their swords. What this means is that it's not unusual to watch or read Bleach and have Ichigo be of a certain power level. He then goes into training, but his training is only, I don't know, three days? But within those three days, he learns something really important about himself and his sword, and as a result, comes back 10 times stronger than before. Other anime fans look at that and say, man, look at that terrible writing, or Ichigo always has it easy, or he learns everything so quickly, whatever point they may be making. In reality, within this world, what Ichigo has done is extremely important. This particular criticism of Bleach really bothers me, so forgive me if you already understand, but I want to give an example that will tie this together properly. Let's say you have two sets of a couple. We'll call them couple A and couple B. Now, couple A has a huge fight and they break up. The reason they broke up is because the man in couple A wasn't spending enough time with his girlfriend. She wasn't having that and she broke up with him. Cool. Now, couple B also breaks up for the same reason. Same reason on both ends. Now that both have been broken up with, we find that it takes the man from couple A one week to realize that it was his fault for not being there emotionally for his former girlfriend. He comes to realize that he spent a lot of time on video games and did not show her the love and respect she deserves. He learns all of this in three days. Now, make no mistake, he doesn't get her back. She's gone forever. But he learns his lesson, he forgives himself, and he moves on. He eventually finds another girlfriend, and he doesn't make the same mistake twice. Now, the man from couple B has the same situation, but instead of three days, it takes him three years to undergo the proper mental maturation to realize that it was his fault. It takes him three years to accept his faults and his failings. Once he does so, he forgives himself, moves on, and finds another woman to be with. Okay, measure these two instances beside each other. Both reached the same place, but one reached there in three days, and the other in three years. Is it fair to say that the man in couple A meant it less because he completed it faster? And is it fair to say that the man in couple B loved his girlfriend way more than A because it took him three years to get over her? Neither seem fair. The fact of the matter is, different people mature at different rates. There's no right way to do so. And so my point in all of this is to say, maybe Goku needed to spend years in the hyperbolic time chamber. Maybe Naruto had to endure months of training for Sage Mode and maybe Luffy had to train with Rayleigh for two and a half years. That shouldn't and doesn't diminish Ichigo going to the Soul King's palace, having a revolutionary conversation with Old Man Zangetsu, learning the truth of his history and his birth and his family lineage, and coming out with more power than most captains. One is not more important than the other, and one is not more impressive than the other, unless you believe that things should only happen one way. In Bleach, things are different. That's just a fact. Okay, so now that we've cleared that up, let's circle around back to Shikai. Once you learn your Zanpakuto's name, you earn a Shikai. Within the world of the Zanpakuto, there are categories. For example, you have elemental type Zanpaktos. You think Ryujin Jaka from Yamamoto or Hyorin Maru from Toshiro. You have your close range types like Renji Zabimaru or Ikaku Sozoki Maru or even Kimpachi's Nozorashi. And then there are hacks type Zanpaktos like your Kyokosui Getsu from Aizen or your Katsun Kyokatsu from Shinsu Kyoroku and so on. There are a ton of different kinds of Zanpakuto that exist and they usually fit into certain categories. Another important thing to understand about Zanpakuto Shikai is the difference between techniques and abilities. In Bleach, each Zanpakuto has an ability, but that's different from a technique. Let's look at an example. Toshiro Zanpakuto Shikai is Hyorin Maru. Its ability is ice, but his affinity for ice is different from the technique he employs like Ryusenka or Hyoten Hyakuso. In other words, it's just important to remember that Shinsui Kyoroku's Zanpakuto ability turns children's games into reality, but when he does an Ira Oni or a Bushogoma, those are techniques and not his Zanpakuto ability. You might be hearing that and thinking that's not that important, but it is. Because for someone like Ichigo, Getsuke Tensho is not a Zanpakuto ability, it is a Zanpakuto technique. If it was an ability, Ishin wouldn't be able to use it because Zanpakuto abilities cannot be shared. Furthermore, a key aspect of Zanpakuto battle involved the clashing of spiritual pressures, so I feel like I have to specify this. Kubo explains that depending on the opponent, if the attacker has significantly less spiritual pressure than the one they're attacking, their ability might just not work. A classic example here is Soifon's Ningekikisatsu technique, 
It didn't work against Aizen because his energy was just so much more powerful than hers that he just negated her ability. In theory, there will be those who are just so powerful that they pimp slap people's abilities just because. Moving on, after attaining a Shikai and mastering your Shikai, that is, to be able to converse with your Zonpak Toe, be able to learn its techniques, and be able to see the physical manifestation of your Shikai, you become eligible to attain a Bankai. The pathway to attaining Bankai involves manifesting your Zonpak Toe into physical form and dominating it. The key word here is domination. That could mean different things for different people. As I established before, in Bleach, it's not about brute force all the time. Accomplishing whatever your Zanpakuto needs you to do in order to, quote, submit it, is paramount to attaining a Bankai. Now look, under normal circumstances, attaining a Bankai takes 10 years, but in recent times, there's been an influx of certain talents who have attained Bankai relatively quickly. While that feat is impressive, I believe their more important factor is the mastery of said Bankai. If you didn't know, I'm a champion of the idea called Bankai Mastery. What it basically means is that simply attaining a Bankai is worlds apart from mastering a Bankai, and the difference in power between the two is night and day in my opinion. Ichigo Kurosaki in the Soul Society arc attained a Bankai and immediately headed into battle against Byakuya, but as White said to him during that fight, his entire body was creaking under the strain of his own Bankai. It was crushing his own body because he had not mastered it. Take Renji. Against Byakuya in the Soul Society arc, while he was using Hihio Zabimaru, he lost control of his blade and it cost him that fight. Rukia Kuchiki in Thousand Year Blood War. She unleashes Haka no Tagame, and it's an incredibly powerful Bankai, but in this state, she cannot move, and if she does not take careful time raising her temperature back to normal, she will die. Kenpachi Zuraki's Bankai. He ticked back his arm to swing at Gerard Valkyrie, and his arm blew off. It literally just poof, just like that. Why? Because he had not mastered his Bankai. The point I'm getting to here with all these examples is that when you look at the kind of characters I've named, the Rukias, the Renjis, the Ichigo, the Toshiros, and you compare their usage of Bankai to the Byakias, the Yamamotos, the Unohanas, and the Shinsui Kyorakus, you can see the sheer gap in mastery. The older fighters know the limits of their strength, and they know exactly how to mitigate the negative effects of their power. Byakuya created a safe zone within his Senbon Zakura because he understood that his Bankai was just that dangerous if he did not take care of himself. Yamamoto and Shinsui have very clear ideas on how long they can remain in Bankai and they do not extend its usage beyond a very specific point. That is the value of Bankai mastery. One does not simply attain a Bankai. No, one must master it. Okay, so that's Zanjutsu. That is Zanpakuto art in Bleach. Pretty cool, isn't it? I know it is. Now let's talk about movement art, also called Ho-Ho. Each race in Bleach has their idea of a movement art. For Soul Reapers, it's called Flash Step. The main principle around Flash Step is the speed used to get from point A to point B in the least amount of steps. The really good users of Flash Step can get from point A to a far away point B without having to use many steps while others have to constantly shift from one point to another point in between before arriving at point B. The Shinigami with the fastest flash step in Soul Society is Yoruichi Shihoin, also called Flash Master. Also carrying a reputation of speed was Tenjiro Kirinji, known as Lightning Fast Tenjiro. Shinigami who end up with the stealth core usually have an especially high expectation to master Shunpo because their job usually has to do with assassination and stealth work. Hakuda is the third art of Soyiping that focuses mainly on hand-to-hand -hand combat. For a Soyiper officer, it's important to not just be able to use your sword and your Zanpak toe. You have to be able to fight without it as well. Characters like Yamamoto, Soifon, and Yoruichi showcase how important it is to be able to fight with or without a sword. Yamamoto especially showcased just how devastating he can be just with his fists and spiritual pressure, and Yoruichi went even farther and created an entire unique technique of fighting around the idea of Hakuda called Shunko. There's a lot of room for individual creativity when it comes to Hakuda, that much is for sure. The final art of Soyiping is Kido, magic art. This is honestly probably the second most important and practiced art outside of Zanjutsu 
and for good reason. The Kido system of Bleach works like this. There are spells numbered 1 through 99, with 1 being the weakest and 99 being the strongest. For each spell, there is an incantation, but the more skilled the practitioner of Kido is, the less reliance they are on using an incantation. However, if they do decide to use an incantation before or after they fired it, it will make their Kido attack stronger. The individual strength of the user also determines how powerful the Kido attack will ultimately be. What that means is, Aizen using Shakaho will be different from Renji using Shakaho because Aizen is Aizen and Renji is Renji. Kido is classified into three subtypes. Binding spells or Bakudo immobilize enemies and prevent them from moving. It also involves barriers, shields, and seals of different kinds. Destruction spells or Hados are offensive-based spells which inflict damage onto enemies. Some Hados require a sacrifice of some kind in order to release the technique, with an example being Hado number 90, Ito Kaso, which requires the sacrifice of a limb. Finally, there's Healing Kido, or Kaido, which is primarily used by members of Squad 4 to heal wounded enemies. Unohana is special in that she can use Kaido in the midst of battle and heal herself while fighting. An important thing to understand is that while it's imperative for every major Bleach Captain or Vice Captain to know how to do all these things I've mentioned, individual biases and perspectives impact their willingness to do these things. Kenpachi Zaraki infamously will not use Kido of any kind, and he became a captain without even knowing the name of his own Pakuto. Ichigo Kurosaki is not a Soyipur, and so never received any formal training on the utilization of Kido. So as powerful as he is, and he is powerful, he will never use Kido of any kind. But all in all, I believe that the way of the Soyipur presents different styles of fighting that each individual can major in to their ultimate benefit. And to be quite honest, think about the possibilities that could be created in a Bleach game based on Kubo's battle system. Like, I don't know about you, bro, create a character, get a Zompok to ability, and then you can put in your attributes into Hakuda, you can put it into Hoho, -Ho, you can put it into Zanjutsu, level it up, get more abilities. I'm like, bro, give me a Bleach game, give it to me now. Now let's talk about the Arankars slash Hollows. On the opposite side of the Shinigami stand the Hollows and Arankars of Waco Mundo, and they have a mini battle system onto themselves. Arankars are Hollows who have removed their masks and crossed over to the world of the Soyipur, incorporating aspects of Soyipur combat into their own. To start with, Arankars possess something they call a Hiero, their tough outer skin that acts as an armor. You instantly need to be of a certain power level to even pierce their Hiero. Ichigo's Tenzel Zangetsu wasn't able to pierce Grimjaw's hero, and that's how Grimjaw would just grab Ichigo's blade barehanded with no issue at all. Arankars then have another ability called a Pesquisa, meaning inquiry. It allows them to sense and measure Ryatsu. This is how they're able to know if an opponent is more powerful than them because in some situations, they may elect to run and preserve their lives instead of fighting the battle they cannot win. If they do decide to engage in combat, Arankars have a plethora of abilities at their disposal. They have their Sero attack, which is a powerful release of lights only Hollows can fire. They have a smaller, less powerful, but faster version of the Sero called the Bala, and a greater, more powerful version of the Sero called a Grand Ray Sero. Their movement technique is called the Sonido, which means a sound ceremony, and you can tell the difference between Sonido and Shunpo based on the sound it makes. Shunpo sounds like paper ripping, whereas Sonido sounds like a big boom. It's not really meant to be stealthy. It's meant to be impactful. Hollows who do cross over to become Arankars are granted Izan Pakuto, much like the Shinigami. Their true hollow selves are sealed inside of the sword, and when they unseal it during battle, they leave their humanoid form behind and take on a visage very similar to their true hollow forms. This release is known as a Resurrection, or a Resurrection. Most Arankar have one Resurrection, except Ukiyo Schiffer, who has a second stage Resurrection called Segunda Etapa. Kubo has been on record stating that the surviving Arankar, like a Grimjaw or a Hardy Bell or a Nell, could, in theory, attain a Segunda Etapa. So that's the Hollows. Let's talk about the Quincy next. The Quincy are a race of spiritual beings with inherited power from Yuha that allows them to harness the Ryatsu in the atmosphere around them for battle. They are especially weak against Hollow Ryatsu and can die if they are wounded and killed by a Hollow. But in exchange, Quincy are able to completely destroy Hollows, unlike Soul Reapers who just purify them. Even though all Quincy utilize bows and arrows in general, 
you'll find that modern Quincy are not bound by archery combats compared to their comrades in the past. Quincy's were taught how to draw energy from their surroundings in order to craft their weapons, something that is typically what we call a holy arrow or a hiling pafile. They utilize this method of drawing energy and amass it at their feet to create a stream of reishi that they're able to skate over. That is called Hiden Kyaku. Unlike the Sonido and the Flash Step, Hiden Kyaku seems to give them a foothold to shift and skate over. Soul Reapers and Hollows can fly, but it's just a little detailed difference between the three of them. The Quincy's have a few unique abilities they can use in battle, and I want to go through the major ones that play important roles in the story of Bleach. When it comes to Quincy Craft, there are two different interpretations of it. We'll call one the old school and the new school. So those are the two differences, old school versus new school. The old school method focused a lot on bows and arrows, gears and gadgets, and the utilization of the lit steel, the last style, or the final stand in some translations. Whereas the new school isn't bound by bows and arrows. It doesn't use a ton of gear and has a better version of the lit steel called the Forstan Dish. Or uh, do we pronounce it the Forstan Dishu? I'm just going to say complete holy form and be done with it. But let's talk old school first. For the old school, Quincy are able to form different kinds of bows. There are reishi bows where it looks like the bow in of itself is just a manifestation of reishi. And then there are large physical looking bows like Uri had in Soul Society. But then even beyond that, there are smaller, more mobile types of bows like Uryu in Fulbrink and Ryukin uses sometimes in Bleach. Kubo doesn't spend a lot of time explaining the value of the different sizes, but I can imagine the smaller ones are able to be fired by one hand, whereas the longer ones can pack more power but require two hands. And so it's probably a matter of speed. Smaller bows increase speed, bigger bows increase attack potency. In the old style of fighting, if a Quincy undergoes the sacred holy training, which is to head to the fifth field and put on a sonray glove and then proceed to fire arrows for one week straight without stopping, they reach the pinnacle of power if you're an old school Quincy. Which is kind of funny, but you know, bear with me. If you put on the sonray glove and you fire an arrow in the fifth field for one week straight, you maximize your ability. However, should a time arise when the sonray glove abilities are not great enough, the Quincy can take off the glove for a one-time massive boost in power that will cost them all of their spiritual energy. This is called the lit still slash last style slash final stand. Take your pick, whichever you like. Now, the last style of a Quincy is not a joke. Just for perspective, Uryu in his last style form once shotted Mayuri Kurotsuchi in Bankai. One shot, Mayuri. Like, this is not a joke. I don't even want to think of how good Uri would do against other captains in his last style form because he was really, really strong. There's a few more gadgets that Uryu has via the old style, but these are the major points I care to elaborate on for the purposes of where we're gonna go in the future. So moving on to the new style of Quincy, the new school, there's a ton of more variety to play with here. First, we have the Blute Artery. It involves channeling Reishi through the vascular system of the Quincy and using that to physically enhance their bodies. The inverse of Blute Artery is Blute Vene, which enhances their defensive capabilities, enabling them to block Shinigami blades with just their hands. You famously see this when Uryu clashes with the Squad Zero member known as Senjumaru, blocking her attacks with his blute. Should a Quincy ever be able to not continue fighting due to injury, they call on something called a Ranso Tengai. They create these thread-like strings of Reishi that connect on a nerve-like level and allow them to manipulate their bodies like puppets on strings in order to fight until their bodies literally turn to dust. They have abilities like the Sclavare, domination over all forms of Reishi by breaking it down to its most basic form and absorbing it along with whatever qualities of Reishi it originally possessed. While all of those are great, the trump card of the modern day Quincy is the usage of these two abilities. The first is the Shrift and the second is a complete holy form. Now, a Shrift is an ability given to a member of the Stern Order by Yuha who bestows to them a power by inscribing a letter representing that ability onto their souls via a blood ritual. The key thing about Shrifts is that Shrifts are a representation of the person's own personality. For example, Baz B doesn't get Stern Order H for heat and then become a hothead. Yuha uses his power to see the countenance and personality of the person and bestows onto them a power befitting who they are. Baz B is a hothead and thus has shrift H for heat. 
as not as fearful and thus has shrift F for fear. Bambietta Bastardbine has an explosive attitude and thus gets E for explode. Shrifts are a gateway into the personality of the person wielding it. Now, within the shrift itself, the Quincy has a lot of range as to how well developed or underdeveloped it can be. Grammy's shrift V for visionary is very powerful, but it could have been even more powerful if he had the foresight to practice imagining multiple things at once, so that he's able to think about healing and think about fighting and think about defending all at once. In his battle with Kenpachi, his lack of practice started to show. If he stops thinking about defending, he'll get cut. And if he reacts too late to the cut and doesn't think to heal in time, he'll die. Things like that matter in Quincy Craft. The pinnacle of Quincy abilities, however, is the Forstan Dish, the complete holy form. In this unique form, the full extent of a Quincy's capabilities is released and they become extremely powerful. Each form is unique in its own way from the colors to the appearance and the wing type almost. Depending on the specific ability of the Quincy, complete holy form is not merely a boost in power, it dramatically increases the way their combat attacks function. For example, in this normal state, as Nott has to pierce you with his thorns to have his fear take effect. However, in his complete holy form, his abilities extends to his eyes, it extends to a neurological level. If you look at him, his ability can have effect. There are also Quincy who are imbued with powers of the Soul King, and as such, their complete holy forms are tied to the power they possess. Someone like a Perninda Prokinjaws and a Gerard Valkyrie, whose power is rooted in Soul King-based abilities, will be slightly different from, say, a Bambietta or a Baz B. Finally, let's talk about Forbringers. I don't actually have a lot to say about Forbringers, but I want to hit on just a few important factors, and then we'll get out of here. Forbringers are spiritually aware human beings whose mothers were attacked by hollows before they were born. Traces of hollow Ryatsu remain inside the mother and is consequently passed on to the child. This gives them a very unique special ability. The main foundation of their power, namely the Forbring, draws on the soul that resides in inanimate objects and uses them for combat. In the Fullbringer combat system, each Fullbringer needs a token on which to draw their powers from. Ginjakuku's Cross of Scaffold has a token which is his chain. For Tsukishima, it's his book. For Ichigo Kurosaki, it's his combat pass. Each Fullbringer has a physical item that acts as the conduit through which they're able to use their Fullbringer abilities. Using their powers, they can walk on water, they can manipulate liquids, and they can create footholds in the air to boost speed. That's called Bringer Light. The important difference you'll find in Fullbringers versus other creatures is that Fullbringers are still human, and so the abilities that they're using are tied directly to their physical body. This isn't a soul being separated from a body. You use your ability with your real body. What that means is that you tire easily if you do not do extensive work to build your stamina. The different kinds of abilities they possess is honestly, in my opinion, is quite varied. There doesn't seem to be any real structure at play here, like Orihime and Chad, who are Forbringers, have vastly different abilities. Tsukishima's Book of the End is super different from Ginjo's Cross of Scaffold, which is massively different from Gidiko's Time Tells No Lies. The only big takeaway I have of Forbringers in the grander scheme of things is twofold. One, Ichigo's Forbring abilities reinforced his Shinigami abilities and made him stronger overall. And that's good because it can act as a multiplier of some sort if you're one who has both Forbring and Shinigami abilities. Secondly is Kazui Kurosaki, who is also likely a Fullbringer because Orihime has been attacked by Hollows numerous times throughout the story of Bleach, and just like Ichigo showcased that he could do, Kazui can envelop his Soi form over his human form. Ichigo did that just one time when he first gained his powers, but after that he usually separates his soul and his body to not make it complicated, but Kazui was shown to transform his physical body into his spiritual body, which very few people are able to do. So overall, I think I've given you a very good foundation of the battle system of Bleach and how it works and the details and the mindsets behind the choices that Kubo has made here. The reason why I wanted to make this video is because I'm preparing to step into Bleach combative content, and I wanted to lay this foundation for the groundwork on how I think about Shinigami combat, about Quincy art, hollow battle styles, and Fullbringer abilities. It's important that we're on a similar page as to how we view Kubo's power system, so that when I start putting certain characters up against each other in future videos, you're very aware of how my train of thought operates. Anyway, let me know what you think about this down below. Any questions, comments, feel free to ask me, we'll talk about it, and make sure you like and subscribe. This is your boy Rebirth, signing out until the next video next week, same time. 
Peace out.